Hello, all. Welcome to a very special edition of uh, an extra edition of Feedback, if you will. It's the end of the year. We had a little bit of professional capital remaining, so we used it to get these two gentlemen here on the show to answer uh, some of your questions. First off, uh, President and CEO Insomniac, Ted Price, thank you so much for being here, sir. That's awesome. We appreciate you being here. Also founder. I'm just throwing that out Oh, there. and founder. I'm so sorry. And founder of Insomniac Thanks, Games as well. Uh, <laughs> Morgan Webb, fact checker extraordinaire, <laughs> is here. And then design director and self-proclaimed Tony Stark of video games. Mr. Cliff Lazinski. I still hate Epic your face. Games. Absolutely. <laughs> Every single ounce of my being. Uh, Cliff uh, from Epic Games is here as well. Guys, uh, again, thank you guys Thanks for, for being us. here. We really appreciate it. Uh, typically, this is a show where we discuss um, the, the, the gaming news that happened that week and things like that. But a big portion of our show is actually fan feedback questions. So I thought what we do is get you guys here for about a half hour and just put you under the gun. And just ask you uh, questions directly from the people that are writing on your forums that you're never exposed to. No, I would never, no idea. We never get insulted or see compliments <laughs> or anything in between. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so we figured we'd just kind of fire some of those at you guys. But before we do that, I just want to go down the list real quick. This is arguably one of the best years, I think, in gaming. Uh, you know, old genres were, were revamped, new genres were, were discovered, and there's just a lot of great stuff going on in gaming. So uh, just quickly, what was your big kind of wow? moment this year in gaming for you uh I, to start off me me personally um there's just the moment in skyrim where uh i was doing something it's just like running around trying to find a random farm that i could potentially help somebody out with and a dragon dro- dropped out of the sky and immediately fought me and that was the moment where i said wow games are pretty freaking awesome is he going forwards or backwards uh he was a forest dragon because <laughs> i hadn't installed the patch yet Got it. that changed the way the dragons Did they beep but, as they went backwards <laughs> Uh, but that was uh, there were a bunch of great moments. That was mine, w- one of many. But Ted, you know, what was the moment where you're like, ah, games are really, really cool. I, you know, I'll try to avoid Skyrim because I've been playing more Skyrim than anything else. <laughs> but I'd say uh, back of the cargo plane in Uncharted Three, mm-hmm. pretty freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah, great. And Morgan, um, I would have to say that playing Saints Row and. There's a lot of sort of conventions, like once you make a character, you can't change what your character looks like. You can't change your character's gender. And in Saints Row, they're like, you can pretty much do whatever you want. We know that you can change your mind. We know that you want to do everything you can do. So I just like the freedom. They let you do whatever you want to do in that game. I'm not ashamed to admit that I think I may have spent more time dressing my character in Saints Row than actually playing Saints Row. And I played through the entire game. That's just how much time I've spent changing my clothes. I need, I need to get a copy of that. I've, I've been hearing amazing things. Uh, yeah. Dave Nash, one of our leads, was telling me like the opening hours, like this great kind of Quentin Tarantino action oh, fest yeah. and things like that. And I look at the engineering effort that went into that with like Harrier jets and and pink double dildos and all this madness. <laughs> and I'm just like, I need to get to that. But that's um, the first time engineering and pink double dildos has ever been used in the same sentence. Uh, outside of the first time they engineered the pink double dildos, <laughs> yeah, right. which is uh, guys with beakers and stuff. <laughs> um, but it's I'm, I'm going to go on the nose, man. I can't help it with Skyrim, and it's it's this game is very very personal to me because uh, I grew up loving games like Zelda and Ultima and then I really haven't liked RPGs in forever. I played the first 20 minutes of Oblivion and I'm like, I'm killing rats and the facial animation is horrible. I can't do this. No offense. And I hadn't played an Elder Scrolls game. I hadn't played Daggerfall, everything like that. This is tickling that part of my brain that goes back to my New England childhood exploring the woods, finding snakes and and God knows what out there and uh, it's the first game I've ever played where I have to traverse a great distance and I go oh God, yes, as opposed to oh, really? Right? And I mean it's mentally changing me. Like we're walking around outside seeing lavender and like, ooh, I need to harvest <laughs> <laughs> right, it's like after the first time you played ha- Half Life, and you, you kind of see the door handles and things like that in the world, and that's when a game truly has an impact for me personally. Is when it messes with my real world meat space. You're tasting right. plants that you find on the street to see what well, they what, do. Well, what are we teaching children, by the way, with, with that whole like you know, go pick some <laughs> in the woods and just eat it, see yeah. what happens. These right? mushrooms look like they'll do something good. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's going to be a lawsuit there at some yeah. point. Yeah, lesson to everybody at home. By the way, don't make the recipes in the game. First hand experience, not a good idea. Uh, and because Todd's not here, since we are talking about his game, can we just speculate as to how, as two men who have put a significant amount of content on game discs, how they fit that game on one disc? What black magic did they use here, guys? Virgin blood. <laughs> Virgin blood. I feel like Ted might have a different answer. What did they do, Ted? How did this happen? I was going to say unicorn horn powder, but that's about, absolutely you know, that's an aphrodisiac. Yeah. Is it? Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, then maybe they got a double. You know, a lot of. Chemicals, I guess, in the game have multiple properties. This might be the second. Maybe they use Stacker. Do you remember Stacker, that old program for your hard drive that like magically quadrupled your hard drive space until it crashed? Yeah. Maybe they use a new version of that. I still have no idea. Really. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. I mean, it, again, kudos to those guys for making an amazing game. Uh, but uh, let's talk about what the fans have to say. And this is something I know that you guys, especially recently, have probably been presented with this question quite a few times internally. Um, Musim says, what aspects of the next generation of consoles uh, do you think the public are going to care about the most? 
And how will the mobile marketplace affect the next generation's console sales as well? That is a bazillion dollar question, and you're leading with one of the most compelling ones right now. Uh, it's uh, For me, it's multifaceted, right? Uh, and I've, I was saying at my GDC lecture a while back that uh, everybody's like, games are becoming services, right? And you need to just stick with that. And it's like, well, what does that really mean? And when I look at what I'm playing right now, to go back to Skyrim, I hate to do it again, but if I could, you know, at the bus stop or, you know, on the airplane, sit there with my iPad and, you know, do some alchemy or, or do some sort of little, little fun, little busy work that contributes to my levels going up, I would do that. And then I don't have to do as much of it in the game, right? So I think it's moving towards the game always staying with you, always being in your head, always being persistent. And, but that scares me at the same time because I believe that fundamentally, if a game is going to be a service, people only have the time and or money for one or two services tops. Right. And so it could get really, really ugly out there, I think, in the marketplace. Right. I guess so. I mean, I, I look at um, you know, games will be ubiquitous. Basically, ubiquitous gaming is what I'm hoping for. And it's not it's more than just being able to use your iOS device for something that's cool in the game. It's actually being able to play that game and have a universal save across all your devices was what mm -hmm. I really want to do. Because this morning I'm reading a book on my iPad and then I go and I continue reading it on my iPhone. And then at work, I pull it up on my PC with the Amazon cloud reader. Right. I mean, that's the kind of thing I want to see from the games I'm playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we are going there. And I think that is sort of the question he may be asking, you know, are we going to have this huge crossover between mobile and console? Mm -hmm. And we could, I think by the, the next five years, I mean, mobile is getting very close in terms of what it offers visually. Do you think sure. genre wise, it, could, it presents a design challenge not to drift too much here, but just as, you know, one developer yeah. to another, like if, you know, if my version of Skyrim is on my iPhone right. and the screen is shrunk and the controls as far as how, you know, it's an entirely different thing. As yeah, far as, can, it's the same thing with the first person shooters, right? Yeah, the control question is a big one. I don't think anybody's cracked that yet on either on any touch device. And there've been some games, I think that have you know, tried the virtual joystick and I'm not a fan. The buttons tap, you know, tap buttons on the right. screen. And that so far isn't well, so working very well. My question, uh, going back to you know, to Apple, is Apple recognizes the fact that uh, okay, you know, I might need a, a keyboard to attach to my iPad for long-term typing. Well, what about long-term gaming? As far as having kind of a bridge joystick that has a little bit more of a traditional twin sticks type setup, like why not do that? It's just, I can't wrap my head around it because no, the the virtual twin sticks for me is just exhausting after 15 seconds. Yeah, I, I think maybe if I mean this is probably not going to happen, but I, I would imagine that there's some peripheral makers out there that are thinking, I could build something that it goes around an iPad yeah. and fits really well ergonomically and just gives me that extra stuff I need for my thumbs. Absolutely. If that was there, I'd buy it in a second. Absolutely. Right. And then control stuff aside, Morgan and I, we, we had a meeting yesterday about X-Play 2012, what we're doing moving forward in the future. And one of the big topics that came up, to, to your point, is that mobile gaming and even social networking gaming, visually it's to a point now where it is compelling enough to where two years ago, if you would have asked us whether we'll ever show an iOS or an Android game on X-Play to review it, we'd be lied. like, absolutely Damn. not, that's so boring. But now we're at a point where we truly not only have to recognize that these games exist, but in a lot of ways we can celebrate how great a lot of them are. Do you guys look at what you're doing? I mean, con on a console level, you guys have done tremendous things. But looking at those two markets, I mean, are, are you seeing opportunity for you to expand not only the franchises you have, but you're like, wow, maybe we have an idea that wouldn't make sense for a console, but this is a great mobile game. Well, I think that what's I think we can't ignore browser either because mm -hmm. I mean, today Bastion came out on Chrome. Mm -hmm. And I, I was at work and just I've been playing it on Xbox Live. And then I was, the fact that I was able to play it in Chrome within about two minutes was mind-blowing for me. And Bastion's not a simple game yeah. in terms of the graphics. Right. And so what you're saying is you want that narrator to follow you around everywhere <laughs> throughout the day. Yeah. Everybody wants Sam, a Sam Shepard type. Ted yeah. gets Korean short rib barbecue. He feels <laughs> nasty about it. Well, and then there's Glitch, too, which is sort of, you know, has a lot of MMO qualities, and that's mm -hmm. browser-based as well. I mean, I think they're going to become more and more popular. It's a good point. An I, don't, point. I don't see the desktop going away any, anytime soon. I haven't, like, uh, I'm a big iPad fan. I absolutely love it, but it seems like like one out of every four websites I go to or videos or and it's not just flash there's always something that just doesn't quite work right that I have to make a note for myself oh I gotta check that when I get back to a desktop PC still to the state mm -hmm. I think it'll get better eventually but you know it's all, all goes back to the whole thing about you know tablets are for consuming media whereas you know desktops yeah. are for creating uh, but you can tell Apple wants to shift that I mean the commercials where they're showing people editing video on uh, you know iPads and things <laughs> right. like that I love right? those commercials because like it's never that easy no the person's just like oh look at my video and if my mom saw that that'd be a reason for her to not buy an iPad but, she'd uh, be like, oh, where's the video stuff that you showed me earlier why can't I watch you know yeah. reruns of Cagney and Lacey on this thing but that's a really nice. good point and I think that I mean talking about your mom right mm -hmm. or talking about my mom they're not 
not uh, consumers of electronics uh, like right. we are. But then I look at the, the generation behind us and I look at my kids and they have grown up basically comfortable with whatever screen is in front of them. Give them a phone, give them an iPad, TV, PC, whatever. They make no distinction. Yeah, the, the, every, every generation, as of the last 10 or 15 years, it's, they see it and they're like, ooh, I'll dive in. Whereas before it was like, ah, uh, scary technology thing, right? Yeah. I, I used to know, uh, you know, older people used to joke and be like, oh, you have a confuser? I'm like, what? You're a confuser, <laughs> right? And it's like, uh, and you don't <laughs> say that anymore. Yeah, I'm now staring they're embarrassed at it. to say that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is a question I, I'm sure you guys get quite often, but I love how he couched it, or maybe she, Yama Caruso says, Insomniac and Epic are two of the best studios producing shooters today. Fact. Not opinion. <laughs> Clearly, you guys love shooters. Otherwise, you wouldn't be making them. However, if you weren't making shooters, what kind of games would you be making? <laughs> you get asked that sometimes, right? In every interview you've ever done, ever? No. That's the first time I've been asked. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd, I'd go back to that uh, exploration-y kind of uh, RPG-ish type thing, right? That kind of, I mean... Uh, before Darksiders came out, Lee, Lee Perry had, on our team had proposed making a kind of Zelda-esque game, but for the more of the grown-up crowd, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an entire market there to take every genre and title Nintendo has done and do an adult, like, kind of angled version of it, because that generation in many ways has grown up as much as I love Mario and Zelda, right? You know, it's, you know, Zelda's amazing, but to see, you know, that, that Skyrim is, is, for me as an adult, is my new Zelda, right? And to, to get that feeling of exploration and adventure, and, you know, that I could go anywhere, and, I could, and anything could happen to me, and just a very vast landscape of all these varying terrains, and I would love to just get lost. And I mean, it goes back to when I was little, and I was such a Zelda fan before uh, Zelda 3 ever came out, and I actually drew my own map of Hyrule, because, you know, you'd have the mountains up top, they can have the beaches at the bottom and the desert wasteland off to the side and then the you know dense forest and all these little terrains and all of that. And uh, just uh, get back to that feeling of exploring in the woods and do that. Because, you know, I love shooters. You love shooters, right? But, you know, everybody only assumes like that, you know, I only play dude bro games because I make dude bro games. And that's and I like all sorts of things. I think what I've learned there is that Cliff will definitely retire in the woods. <laughs> you're going to get a cabin somewhere and you're just going to go explore stuff. I'm thinking of starting a militia. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to join? Uh, there are plenty out there I think you could probably join already. True, true. Scary enough. And, and Ted, what about what about you guys? Uh, it's a I think it's easier to answer that question saying, what wouldn't we make? Sure. I, can, I don't think we have a whole lot of racing fans and a whole lot of sports game fans at Insomniac, mm -hmm. but that kind of leaves the rest of it wide open. And mm -hmm. I, I would agree with you. I think we have, a lot of us love RPGs. We love open world games. And there are tons of opportunities to do something that involves combat and maybe shooting, but maybe is a little le less linear than what we traditionally do. I, right. think our, I think all of us would be interested in that. Did you see that they're working on Planet Side 2? I, I did see that. It was yeah. just one of the, uh, there's all all these games that come out that in the back of my head are like that's it's ready for a remake or a sequel to yeah. get you know get a, fix the mistakes and then reintroduce to a new gener generation right that and was it, way ahead of the curve oh I absolutely thought. absolutely yeah. and I mean you know take a lot you know even take a lot of those uh, MMO or RPG type elements put them into a shooter right because right? uh, you know that's what we do is shoot stuff. Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up, and, and Morgan, uh, t to you first, but then I want you guys to answer as well. What we're seeing now in Hollywood, at least over the last five years or so, is the acquisition of properties that haven't been around for 15 years is sometimes more important than actually developing new properties oh, absolutely. at this point. Uh, you know, we've seen it a lot. I mean, you know what is, I this, about this is this a scary? I, I, I do, but you know, to re to recap, like, it, it's is this a scary thing? And then for you guys, like, the people are putting a lot of their their at least their their. Their, their capital into buying things that may never work, but they worked 15 years ago instead of focusing it's, it's, on new, It's a, new okay, you can have what's behind door number one, which is something that at least maybe a few f people will know about, or you can have what's behind door number two. That's scary. So then you wind up with, like, really bad, obscure 80s TV shows being purchased or cartoons that nobody even remembers or cares about. An we, Asteroids we, movie. Yeah. <laughs> the Battleship trailer? Come on. Uh, really? <laughs> really? Are you kidding me <laughs> right? oh, yeah. that was horrible like the pegs going yeah. to the side of the ship i had a healthy ding, imagination ding. as a child and aliens were never in any of my battlefield games <laughs> no they won't they and won't. i had a very healthy imagination oh. but, you, but you know you're very you're very opposed to this i'm very sensitive about this because i think i'm just very protective about games because i love them so much and mm -hmm. i just don't want to see a lot of the properties i, I don't want to see gaming go hollywood i guess mm -hmm. like i think it's something special and it's a sort of special precious era that we have right now and it's going to change because you know more and more money gets put into these games but, but digital just... distribution and in the indie game scene it changes all of that right yeah. and, and same thing with hollywood in regards to the youtube right i mean the youtube generation you could have you know a, a cheap ass camera and a bunch of friends and make something that has the, uh, a vision that you then wind up getting a, a direct a deal as a director anything like that i mean with the traditional disc-based market 
I mean, good luck getting you know, Sony or Microsoft to publish your little idea. Xbox Live uh, changed it a little bit, sort of the PlayStation Store. But now, I mean, yeah, you know, I go to GDC. There's the Independent Game Developer Festival. You know, Narbacular Drop, Becoming Portal, all of that. I mean, I don't. I think I think it's going to get better for games. Honestly. Yeah, I, mean, I think I totally agree. I think that the opportunity for new IP is stronger than ever because it's coming from all directions now. And anybody, I mean, really, anybody who has an idea can prototype it, can get it up and running. Uh, with a, ser- a whole bunch of different engines, with it's HTML5, Unreal. And if it's cool, people, Unity. people will want to share it to yeah. look cool, right? So it, more than ever, with the combination of uh, you know, having all these tools available and the connectedness of the world, uh, you know, Minecraft just boom, right? That's the example I always point to. If, if it's cool, people will share it, and yeah. it's, it, the opportunity is bigger than ever. I wish all of this was there when I was 17. Yeah, exactly. For it. Uh, we, we got screwed. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we found really our path. For you guys. But my point is it's easier than ever to find that path, right? Yeah. So... Uh, and speaking of that, this is the Agloros, uh, and again, this is something you guys probably get often as well. Uh, to an extent, touching on that, uh, Insomniac has recently made the move to go multi-platform, uh, as we know, with its next game, Overstrike. We've seen Bioware and Bungie leave Microsoft as well in this generation. It seems like more and more developers are ditching exclusivity deals in order to reach the broader audience that you were talking about that is now available. Do you think the trend will continue as we approach the next generation of gaming? I always say, when anybody always asks me, hey, you know some of these guys, why didn't they stick with them forever? My, my immediate like, gut reaction answer is, games cost a lot of money to make, so you want to put them in as many houses as possible. That's, that's what I always say. But then you've got a, a, a console-exclusive franchise that reaches a billion dollars, so obviously these things can still be successful. Um, but could it, again, could the, it have reached two? Yeah, but it could have reached two if it was on the PS3. Uh, but do you think three, that the trend's going to continue? I mean, how <laughs> important is, uh, is, is exclusivity nowadays? I, I think... And maybe, I know you probably can't speak specifically to, to your decisions, but just in gaming, how important is exclusivity, uh, console exclusivity? I mean, for us, uh, we're asked that question. This is another question I've never been asked, <laughs> by the way. Uh, it's one of those things that we have a very good setup with Microsoft, and I can't go into the details, but you know, when you, it comes to marketing spend and, and how much they assist with the production of the game and things like that, uh, we looked at the trade-offs of being exclusive to them versus PS3, and it made sense and for us to you know, stick with it as a first-party platform game um but in the future you know you never know right uh you know anything we might announce uh you know we recognize the ps3's huge install base pc i miss right so mobile of course we're all up in infinity blade so uh cross-platform i think a lot of developers realize it makes the most sense is even you know just to diversify your portfolio right get it across all the board right and then you guys i mean having the ratchet and and resistance franchise would be so successful for uh, the sony brand and then with overstrike being something obviously now across uh, all platforms, that, that that was a big move for you guys as yeah, well. Yeah, it was a an opportunity to reach a much broader audience. Mm-hmm. It's plain and simple. But I I wonder how many more exclusive developers there are left. Really. Mm-hmm. I mean, I when I think of, when There's I think not about a lot now, yeah, a handful maybe yeah. If, right. three, four. I, yeah. I, don't, I mean, in terms of those of us who make uh, exclusives for consoles, sure. So it's probably not even going to be relevant in a few years sure and why why are they a dying breed or for that matter why are they extinct at this point i think that most of us who have gone multi-platform have just seen the business opportunity Mm -hmm. to do so and to hit a bigger audience and if the opportunity is there we're going to take it right you got to wonder also if you know there's enough of an install base for either console you know 50 60 million for either one i think right now uh you know not quite ps 210 million plus but still solid that you know a lot of the people who are hardcore and want to play those kinds of games you know that it's the need is much more uh, there's much more of a need from Sony or Microsoft at the start of a console generation for that as opposed to the tail end, I would imagine. Whereas yeah. right now, I would imagine Microsoft's going, for, you know, they have, they have the hardcore NeoGAF kids, right? You know, now they're going for, you know, the Dance Central uh, Netflix crowd right. Towards, right, and trying to, to get all up in there. But I think, I, I think for all, I mean, any of us who are making IPs, I mean, we want to go broad, right? We want to make sure that the IP is exposed not just on consoles, but everywhere we can, mm-hmm. because that really has become the value in our industry for those of us who are developing. And controlling controlling that IP and exposing it to as many different audiences as possible is ultimately how we can affect more people with what I mean, we do. Does it does it increase the cost a lot to develop for two platforms at once, or you know, sort of the the cost the same no matter how many platforms? I, I don't think it's it's definitely not a times two type right. equation. I mean, there's definitely an, there's additional cost in terms of getting tools and engine up and running for both and doing all the additional testing you have to do, but it's not exactly. Um, it's not a huge cost. Guys, unfortunately, we have time for one more question. Uh, so I wanted one. to, I know, so I'm, <laughs> I'm literally like reading here like, oh, gosh. Actually, one more and then uh, one quick follow-up. But uh, 
I will ask Keok's question. Morgan, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Uh, although you'll probably have a different answer than uh, <laughs> Ted and, and Cliff. The question is, what games inspired you to make video games for a living? Uh, question for you, Morgan, would yes. be, what game, was there any game that inspired you to get into this industry? Was there one game you were like, God, um, I really want to talk about this for the rest of my life? Well, I was in tech, actually, and gosh, I think it was Unreal Tournament 2K4. Oh, That, I, That's that, right. that That's actually right. kind of got me into the industry because I was working in tech, I was working on a tech show called The Screensavers, and... We got these computers in, so we had like gaming Thursdays, and we would sit and play games together, and then we'd all stay after the show to play games together. And I was really quite good at that game. <laughs> and uh, I smoked Matt, I smoked Joshua Brentano, who still works here. Like, so they were like, when they were looking for somebody to put on the game show, they were like, how about that girl that with the, with the mean headshot? Yeah. We should put her on the show. <laughs> she looks like she's got a, an opinion, and that yeah. would be good. It's an angry opinion, but it'll work nonetheless. Yeah. And and Cliff, your answer can't be Skyrim because you've been in the industry for a while now, so you can't say that. <laughs> well, it, it was it, it was the course of a few years because I, I had this brief phase when I was a kid, and I wanted to be a herpetologist. He's a person who st- doesn't study herpes; they study reptiles and amphibians. And okay. uh, then I wanted to be an actor briefly for a while. <laughs> uh, but I, in the back channel, there was always a love of games, starting with Space Invader and the fact that I couldn't get over the idea that I was manipulating an image on my television, like that I moved the joystick and the, the Space Invader is the original cover-based shooter, by the way. Just throwing that out there. Um, and then once Nintendo came around, uh, it was just hook, line, and sinker, like Nintendo Boy, Hardcore, Mario, and Zelda. And, and just that's why, you know, people always cite, you know, the fact that I love Miyamoto and, and what he did for the industry and everything like that. And... Is this sense that I back then I believed that game designers didn't want you to find the secrets they put in their video game, like they were putting their social security number or something in there, <laughs> right. or, or hiding an affair with from their you know, their wife or something. Uh, I'm gonna hide that in my game. Nobody's gonna find it. And uh, that sense of mystery and all of those old Nintendo games was really the primary thing. It's just that that and again it goes back to that feeling of Zelda and exploring in the woods that Skyrim has. Right. How did we find that like fourth bush on the left and that one screen? You burned it to get this. Because you talked about every last all bush. Day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You used no, the no original facts. social network, which is <laughs> the yeah. schoolyard, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ted, what about you? Uh, it's a couple. I'd say Adventure on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, me- I remember the day we got the Atari Twenty Six Hundred for Christmas, and uh, we, my sister and I, didn't stop playing for uh, three or four years That's straight. F- that every <laughs> exactly <laughs> that bad. Stealing everything. Uh, I'd say Metroid was probably the next one that really turned my life upside down in terms of understanding how amazing games could be. Mm-hmm. And But the one that really got me to the point where I started Insomniac was Doom. Mm-hmm. Because I've been playing Doom a lot, and I was thinking, man, this this is where I want to be. I you know Just the, the weapons, the enemies, the feeling, the, the whole theme of the game. The attitude, was, right? The attitude, yeah. And, right I, and so Disruptor, which is our first game, was essentially a Doom clone. Uh-huh. That was my intention at first, and it morphed uh, pretty pretty seriously as we were developing it. But I will always look back with fondness in that particular game. Sadly, there are a few people watching this that don't know about any game that we all just that we all just brought up. They're like, "What is?" What are you Thanks for about? showing my age. Yeah, I know it's <laughs> totally fine. I remember for me, uh, we. For Christmas one year, I got the. You remember the the NES cartridge that had Duck Hunt and Super Mario yeah. and Gyromite on it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember Duck Hunt. Duck Hunt was first, the first uh, option. So I picked that game first and played that for like seven hours. And then my mom and dad were like, because they'd saved up for like seven months to buy me this console. Aww. They're like, you know, there's another game on there as well. You should check that out. <laughs> and then I played Mario, and I was like. These are two different things that I can do in my house at the same time, and that's that's when I felt. Did you have Rob the robot? Oh yeah, man. Okay. Yeah, then it came with the whole package. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you look back, and it's like you really just—it's just a gyroscope that he's moving slowly to move a door up and down. Yeah. That is so boring. <laughs> yeah. But back then, it was amazing. Um, and again, unfortunately, we we don't have any more time. But quickly before we close out here, I know Overstrike is, is something that you guys are really focusing on now. Um, you guys have th- this big announcement a- as well. Um, but what are you guys most excited about? Your fans to see looking forward in the coming year. What do you think? You, what are you, you most excited as a, fan, to see? as a gamer? Yeah. yeah, I say Bioshock Infinite. I mm-hmm. can't wait to see how that turns out. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really generated a lot of buzz at Insomniac when that first trailer came yep. out. We were all thinking, "Oh my!" E three demo, this. right? Yeah, right. That's right. When E three, that's right. E three demo was mind blowing. Right, Morgan. What about you? Uh, I'd have to say Bioshock Infinite. We saw. Was that at E three or was that at Comic? We saw that. The whole, like, the 20-minute that we actually saw them play that yeah. like, level for 20 minutes. I think it was E3. Which I walked I think out was of there. We're... We saw, like, the last show that they had. Like, we were all squeezed in there, and we walked out of there, and we just, I couldn't, 
I couldn't wrap my head around it. Yeah, it's like E3 didn't happen. We typically were so tired, and we're like, the last thing we want to do is talk about video games after 20 plus hours of live yeah. coverage. And we let that was the very last thing we all yeah. saw. And at the wrap party that night, it's it's what we talked about the most. Because my wallet crazy got thing. stolen, and I was pissed that I had to talk <laughs> yeah. to the security person when I really wanted to go see Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite. Infinite. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cliff, what about you? I mean, there is, is there any other choice right now? Because if you look at next year, like, I'm thinking about a lot of the games. And, like, you know, a lot of them are established franchise. Like, Bioshock, you know, there was the first which established it. And then the follow-up, which wasn't the original team, which was actually pretty solid. Um, but when I look at that game, I envy Ken Levine as a creative. Because I sit there watching the E3 demo. My jaw literally dropped. And I'm not blowing smoke up anybody's ass. Just, no uses our engine. F*** that. Whatever. As a game, as a creative vision... Uh, the fact that if I sat there in front of my team and I was like, all right, so check this. It's a city in the sky. Uh, it's got this kind of like tea party thing going on. Uh, you know, the, the nationalism themes like that. There's this girl kind of looks like Alice in Wonderland. There's a giant <laughs> bird that screams at you. Uh, and there's fireworks. And, and, and then the, at one point she morphs into another dimension like teleports. That's an alternate version of 1980s with everybody wants to rule the world and revenge of the Jedi and the Marquis. I could just cut to my team. They'd be like. You're f- high, dude. Yeah. That's right? when the shareholders vote you out. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, but that's the thing is, you know, anything pitched could go anyway. It's all in the execution. Like, really, blue people, Jim Cameron, really, blue cat people, really, but billion dollar movie later, right? right. So it all comes down to the execution and whether or not people buy in and they believe in, and that's why I'm just pumped for that game. I'm dying to see how that game hits the sweet spot, by the way, between the traditional scripted uh, things like you know we do with a Gears game, right? Versus kind of the more open e type Skyrim type elements, right? How it, 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 it ebbs between those two bits, right? Okay. Uh, and that's, so that's how well, I want to see how they pull it off. I just want to save animals through time travel. We can make something that's for you power. here, you I can think. Save you, animals through time yeah. travel. you can't fix I mean, Old Yeller. Do you think that after <laughs> a year like this year, gamers are going to be disappointed if they don't have a, you know, a September, October, November, December, whatever it was like this year? It'll be tough, especially since Star Wars is coming out, right? The very yeah. end of the year. I mean, that talk about a capper, yeah. right? For this year, it's going to be hard to beat. I think they're going to be happy to have to let their wallet have a breather. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I That's wonder it. how many people just said, F the budget. Right. Well, there them were all. a lot yeah. of games that I was like, I'm going to have to get that. It's going to be January. And then, of course, Saints Row turned out to be so good. And I'm like, I guess it's, I guess it's December. I guess I'm getting it now. It's cool. Yes, this holiday's a bloodbath, man. Yeah. yeah. But in a very good way. Yeah, exactly. A bloodbath can be a good thing. Yeah. It's, good for, it's good for the industry. Kind of yeah, people kind of who are way. buying more, more and more games. And that's what, that's what we ultimately yeah. want. We want more people talking about games and sharing those experiences th- with their friends so that gaming just becomes bigger in general. Yeah. Right. Good for all of us. Right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks we for look us. forward to your big, your big project, sir. And then Overstrike as well. <clears throat> Obviously, the trailer. We all got really excited about that. Morgan, I just look forward to you smiling at me once a month <laughs> or so. Oh, and, uh, and you guys can catch uh, new episodes every week on g4tv.com slash feedback every Wednesday. Thank you guys so much for being here.